I always love leading worship with Fred Ross Perry because not only does he have a beautiful voice and sings and adds so much to our worship through song, but he actually even wrote um, that version of Yehi Liratzon and what talent he brings to our community and all the communities he's a part of. Um, and any time you can get Fred and Russell playing together, you should go um, wherever they are. Maybe Shoreline Amphitheater before too long or something like that. We'll call it Russ and Fred and everyone will come and um, it would be terrific, right? Who wouldn't go to that? So, In the past few months, however, chaos has consumed our world. An ongoing war and seemingly endless attacks and war in Ukraine. Dysfunction and disarray in Washington, D.C. Homophobic hate crimes that have made national news. The mass shootings at Super Bowl celebrations and local tragedies that have left families in our community broken. And while much less catastrophic, no doubt, we are nervous about our own community's health here at Betham, with deep fears about the state of our own synagogue and our own congregational hubris. The Jewish world continues to deal with the ongoing aftermaths of Hamas's terror attacks on October 7th. And we know that hostages are still in captivity in Gaza and are not celebrating Shabbat with their families. We are shaken about the ominous threat of war on Israel's northern border. And simultaneously, our hearts break over innocent deaths in Gaza and the warmongering of hateful and dangerous leaders in the Israeli government. In California, anti-Semitic rants and conspiracy theories dominate news headlines, exposing the pervasiveness and rise of Jew hatred in our country. And yet it is Adar. It is hard to arrive at Adar this year, our month of celebration and merriment this year for two months because of our leap year calendar. But it's hard to be here amidst such uncertainty, hatred, and unease. And we know that most of Jewish life, and certainly the joy-filled holiday of Purim, not too far away, wasn't born out of triumph or communal bliss either. On the contrary, it was likely born in an era of uncertainty, violence, and disorder. Yet Purim came about to try and speak to the people. It's done so in our tradition for millennia. The great biblical scholar Adele Berlin writes about Purim. The plot is often unconceiving, unconvincing, because one of the characteristics of farce is the rejection of rationality. Farce enshrines the element of unreason. So the logical impossibility that looms largest, that Mordechai's Jewish identity is publicly known, while Esther's remains secret, suddenly ceases to be problematic and become one more piece in the highly improbable plot. In fact, the entire plot turns on a succession of unlikely events like the selection of a queen in a beauty contest and a series of ridiculous but irrevocable edicts. She continues, the largest interpretive problems melt away if the story is taken, taken as a farce or a comedy associated with a carnival-like festival. The book sets out a threat to the Jews so that the Jewish audience can watch with glee and laugh with relief as it is overcome. The mad and threatening world of the beginning of the story fades into a happy ending where, for a brief moment, the Jews, through their two representatives, can play at wielding the highest power in the great empire to which they were in re really at, in, excuse me, can play at wielding the highest power in the great empire to which they were in reality subservient and which they were an insignificant minority. The story, like its accompanying festival, does what comedy and carnival are supposed to do. It confirms the belief that the power at work in the universe favors life and favors the success and optimism of the Jews. The Book of Esther affirms that all is right with the world and with the place of the Jews in it. 
This idea is actually abundant in our tradition. And we should seize gratitude despite uncertainty whenever we can. How about when we first wake up each morning? In Judaism, we recognize and acknowledge the basic gift of being alive and having the chance at another day. I give thanks to you, living and everlasting God, for you have restored my soul with mercy. Rabbi Felisa Saul writes, in the Torah, the first expression of gratitude comes unexpectedly from Leah upon the birth of her fourth child, whom she named Yehuda. It is written in the Babylonian Talmud in Brachot. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, from the day the Holy One, blessed be God, created the world, no one thanked God until Leah came and thanked God. As it is stated, and she, will be, she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she said, this time I will give thanks to God. And thus he was called Judah. Judah meaning gratitude. From this commentary, we understand gratitude as a recognition of receiving more than we expect or feel we deserve. It's a case of I feel blessed and then some. It is most powerful that these words of gratitude come from Leah who herself is deprived of love and affection. Though she carries a profound sense of what is missing, she can simul simultaneously hold the feeling of plenty and gratitude. I know it is hard for many of us to find gratitude these days. Sometimes when we feel too joyous even, we are shocked out of it, and we are worried about our abundance when others are struggling. How can I have so much fun when there is so much pain in the world? How can I feel good about myself when others struggle? How can I delight in the joy of Adar or the joy of Shabbat? Rabbi Sim Glazer writes, gratitude is hard for some of us because it implies humility. Like the ancient Israelites, how quickly we forget that we could not have reached our lofty status without the help of others. One famous Jewish immigrant, Albert Einstein, notably said, I have to remind myself a thousand times a day of how much I depend on other people for my success. Gratitude is not ignorance or ignoring or naivete. Rather, it's a statement that recognizes the importance of blessings large and small. There are no easy answers to big problems, and those problems abound. We can see chaos and dysfunction and disorder, and we can also be grateful for being here. My dad's favorite poet is the former US poet laureate Billy Collins. I'm sure he's some of your favorite poets as well. And he had a wonderful poem in this week's New Yorker that it sent me down a rabbit hole of poetry this week. And I'll be honest, it was my goal to find one just right for this moment. So tonight, I'll leave you with these wonderful words of Billy Collins. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight by Billy Collins. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight was my mother's usual response to my bouts of childhood whining. I can't find my other sneaker. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight. There's no one to play with this early. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight. My bicycle only has three gears. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight. It's a line best delivered in a rural Irish accent, but my mother didn't have one of those growing up on a farm in Ontario, Canada. Nor did she have much Canada in her voice. Fall to your knees and thank God for your eyesight, eh? <laughs> Was not heard in the hallways of our house. Needless to say, I never fell for it. Though it did create pauses in my trickle of complaints and maybe cleared some room in my room strewn with toys, small tanks and smaller soldiers, 
a little space to think about God and eyesight, but not for long, of course, the demands of childhood. Being what they are and the repeated words sometimes made me think twice before whimpering about a bruise on my knee, or foolishly, I would say, the line, just when she did, the two of us chanting, fall to your knees, which is as far as I got before she appeared in the doorway and pinned me to the floor with that look. No surprise to know that nowadays, I say it every chance I get, to everyone under this roof, including the dog, and under my breath to the people on the street, the one grousing about the price of eggs or gasoline, that one furious that the bus is late, especially when I realize those voices are mine. Me, peevish in the bedroom. Me, bitching about the rain. Me and my broken shoelace. Me in the sand trap. Me forgetting to fall to my knees to thank her for giving me the eyes to see the world, to regard these words. Shabbat Shalom.